As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a distinguished returning guest tonight, J. Wayne Fears, a legendary outdoorsman, a writer, and a rescuer of people in the wild, as well as knowing how to do a wild crafting and survival in the backwoods. J. Wayne Fears has been, uh, he's done graduate work in this area. He's been a, worked as an explorer, spent a decade as a chief wildlife manager. He has over 6,200 magazine articles published and 32 books. He's a popular and frequent guest on outdoor TV programs, speaker at outdoor events, currently working on multiple books. He's here with us again here on Reluctant Preppers. We had a lot of delays in getting this interview because he was traveling so much and out in backwoods country, but he's back and he's here again with us on Reluctant Preppers. Uh, Wayne, thank you for joining us again. My pleasure. We were hoping you could talk with us a little bit tonight about a topic we have never discussed on our program before, and that is survival uh, by finding wild foods to eat, wild edibles, and what are the main principles people need to understand about that in an uh, emergency or crisis situation. So uh, if you could uh, address us that with us and uh, talk to us. First of all, just kind of a question that some guests have asked is, is it even possible for an average person who is not a real expert to find enough sustenance to survive and get enough calories to, to keep ahead in a, in a wild situation? Well, when you combine the protein sources, which uh, would be fish, animals, insects, uh, birds, bird eggs, things of that type, with edible wild plants, in most areas, a knowledgeable person can survive. But when you narrow it down to edible wild plants, then it becomes much more difficult. There's a lot more to learn. Uh, it's a much more complicated subject. And most people don't seem to realize that there are thousands and thousands of plants out there. Uh, a lot of them are edible. A lot of them are poisonous. And a lot of them just, there's no way for your body to convert the plant material to nutrition. So you're talking about having a vast amount of knowledge before you can really become a survival expert in regards to knowing and being able to utilize edible wild plants. And it takes a, a lot of time and a lot of study to know the different plants, and it varies. Um, there's a lot of variables in edible wild plants. For instance, the pokeweed and elderberry, which is found over a lot of the United States, they can be edible in one stage and poisonous in another. A lot of plants will take on the look of an, of a, of an edible plant, that, and, but it may be poisonous. The death, death camas looks a lot like a wild onion or a wild tulip to the untrained eye, but it get them confused, and the death camas will kill you. And then during the winter, you got very few edible wild plants that can be found without having a lot of knowledge of where to look for them. And one of the exceptions to that, I guess, would be the cattail, which has the long sweeping leaves that stick up out of snow, out of ice, and they can be identified. But vast majority of the edible wild plants during the winter, especially in, in a snowy situation, they can be very, very difficult to find. First thing that people in survival classes I've been involved in, they want to buy a book on edible wild plants and go home and study the book a few nights and go out and start foraging around and eating edible wild plants. Well, I've never, in, in the years I've been in this business, I've never known a person who was really knowledgeable about identifying and preparing edible wild plants who learned it from a book. It takes courses that are taught by real experts, and you've got to get hands-on experience. You've got to go out there. You've got to be able to identify the plants, and that's really only the, the beginning. 
you got to know how to prepare these plants. So many of the edible wild plants, just to pick it and eat it, that's not the way to go. You know, your body can't handle it. Uh, it's going to taste terrible to you. If you make a mistake, you're going to get ill. So it takes two major learning curves. The first one is being to identify edible wild plants, and the second is know what you do when you have them. So that's the first thing we try to get across to people when we're teaching survival courses where edible wild plants is a part of the course. It, it requires a lot of times it's a special course unto itself and looking at something on the Internet or reading two or three books on edible wild plants simply is not going to get the job done. A lot of these plants look different during the different seasons. And as I said earlier, during uh, the winter, uh, a vast majority of them you just can't find. Now, uh, you talk about in your uh, in your articles that uh, you need to know how uh, to understand the difference between short-term survival versus long-term survival. Can you make the distinction for us? Of, are there different types of foodstuffs you should be looking for if you really do believe you're just in a real short-term situation versus if you if you're in for the long haul? Yeah, and I think that's one of the first decisions that a uh, survival student needs to make. Is this particular person interested on learning edible wild plants so that in the event that they're lost out there, say on a picnic or a hike or something, uh, they may need to use or they may think they need to uh, be able to identify and forage on edible wild plants. But, you know, a person who is on a short-term survival situation, lost, stranded, whatever, if they followed some basic rules, for short-term survival. That is, they've, they've left uh, their plans with somebody who knows after they hadn't heard from them in a while. They know where to go looking for them. They know they were expected back in two days or three days or whatever the case may be. And usually in these cases in North America, people are found within 72 hours. So there's no reason in the world for that person, if that's all that they they think they'll ever need survival for it. There's no reason for them to spend weeks and weeks and weeks, even years, learning edible wild plants unless that just fascinates them. But, you know, they need to spend more time learning to signal, learning to build shelter, learning fire building skills and things of that type. Now, for people who are what I consider long-term survival, uh, interest people who are, are interested in prepping, people who are interested in living off the land, people who may be in an occupation that takes them in the back country for days and weeks and months at a time. Those are the people that really, I think, need to take courses in the use of edible wild plants, and they need to study plants in their area of interest. Uh, if a person is going to be working mostly around the Okefenokee Swamp in South Georgia, the plants that they're going to need to know about are far, far different than somebody working, say, on the Stikine River up in British Columbia. You know, knowing edible wild plants in Montana is of little use to a person in Florida and vice versa. That's interesting. <laughs> they always say that, like, all politics is local. It sounds like uh, survival on edible wild plants is local phenomenon. It's not necessarily a fully transferable skill, the knowledge. That you need. And this is what we run into this so much, and people want to talk about dandelions and cattails and Jerusalem artichoke or whatever, and they live in an area where those are commonly found plants, but they may be getting ready to, to take a long-term canoe trip into, say, northern Canada in the tundra area, and none of those plants even exist there. So you got a lot of knowledge. It's not going to do you any good at all. And then the other thing is you need to take courses that will teach how these plants, how you can identify these plants during the seasons. Uh, spring greens, uh, summer berries, fall nuts, and winter roots require a lot of knowledge and identification and even more knowledge in preparation. So... If you're a short-term survival person, if that's probably 
going to be the only time you're going to need to know about edible wild plants. You really need to spend more time learning other skills, skills that will keep you alive and comfortable for 72 hours. But if you're a person who is going to be in situations that may keep you requiring food from wild sources for months or years at a time, then that's the person that really ought to be taking the courses, taking the courses that help you identify during all four seasons different plants, and then one that goes further into the preparations. And I like courses where you actually prepare the foods, not just talk about it. Um, it's it's very difficult for the digestive systems most of us have today living in modern America to go from McDonald's one day to eating dandelions and cattails the other day. So it depends on your what you think you're going to need, long-term survival or short-term survival. And that determines how much study you are to put into edible wild plants. You mentioned uh, some of the the uh, changes that can be perilous for people switching from modern processed uh, food diets to wild backwoods diets. And you mentioned that in some cases the... Uh, the, eating the wild foods can make may leave you worse off than you started before, even even if they're not toxic, uh, just because it's such a shock and a change to your system. What are some of the symptoms that could happen predictably and some of the outcomes from those that you need to watch out for? Well, that's, that's where a real problem occurs in a, in a lot of survival situations that people, even if they're knowledgeable of edible wild plants, let's say they suddenly go on a diet of, uh, a mixed diet of uh, rose hips and cattail roots, and uh, say they they try acorns for the first time and some things like that. Suddenly you've got people who they've got diarrhea, they've got vomiting, they've got a, a lot of problems that suddenly occurring in their body. They're losing the uh, water, uh, retain water in the body, and they're beginning to not think straight, and suddenly you got a person who was in pretty good shape and would have probably made it many more days, but uh, due to changing this diet drastically and quickly, they got serious problems, and now they're down and can't do very much of the other things they need to be doing. Most people today have digestive systems that are accustomed to processed food, and then suddenly going on a diet of wild plants, First of all, it's not tasty. Most of these wild plants, without seasonings and, and the things that we're accustomed to, it doesn't taste well. And it doesn't sit very well at all with the gastrointestinal process. The change needs to be gradual. You need, while you're still in really good shape, you need to just gradually, if you see you're going to have to depend on some edible wild plants, you need to do it on a very gradual basis. And again, knowing how to prepare the plants is essential to a person, what I call becoming a beaver, because you go from eating processed food primarily to eating a diet of edible wild plants, and that's all you're eating, the same thing a beaver eats. You could be gnawing on a raw Jerusalem artichoke root, and that's not the same as if it was boiled or baked. So knowing what to do with these different uh, edible wild plant parts is extremely important. I just did an article uh, that's coming out sometime later, later this year, part of this year uh, for our American Frontiersman magazine on how you can find and prepare acorns. Well, most people know acorns when they see them, but there are some acorns that are very can be prepared very tasty. There are some acorns which cannot. And knowing that process to make them edible and to make them tasty is real important if you're going to be depending upon white oak acorns, let's say, to be tasty and nutritious when you need them. And even, you know, you take the Lewis and Clark expedition. When they were at probably the nearest starvation point of the whole expedition, they could not stand to eat bitter root that them. It was plentiful. And the Native Americans that they were around loved it, but the men on the expedition just could not stand the bitter taste of, of the plant we call bitter root. And many, many of our modern stomachs cannot take the change from this processed food to wild plants. 
And like we were saying earlier, that you get into really quick, serious problems, and that will put you down, and then you've got a real problem. Are there any uh, sort of like uh, wild plants for dummies that are just almost always a safe bet in and out of season and, and that are kind of like if you can find that, that's a good place to start? <laughs> Not very many. Uh, you know, the, the cattails are found probably as widely distributed, at least in North America. They're all over the world. I've seen them in four or five different continents, I guess, over the years. But they're, they're found where most people or wandering around unless they're in the desert or something like that. Uh, so your cattails are one which you can eat almost every part of the cattail. And you can say somewhat the same thing about the dandelion. We always use that as a great example of a survival food, but it is found in a lot of places, and you can eat the flowers, and you can eat the roots. You can make coffee out of the roots. You can take the leaves and make salads out of those or add them to soups. You can do a lot of things with them. But again, you got to know what to do with them. You just can't go out there and go to grazing on dandelion and think you're going to make it because you're probably going to, your system will fight you on it and you'll become ill. That other principle you mentioned of is so let's pretend you find yourself uh, for one reason or another uh, out in the outback and you've got a limited amount of uh, food in your backpack. Uh, it sounds like your recommendation for one, among the other things you're going to be doing is don't just keep consuming all of your uh, packaged food that you might have brought along with you until it's completely gone, and then think you'll switch over to wild foods at the last minute. If you think there's any chance, you might need to to start partaking of some or supplementing your diet with wild foods. It sounds like you're saying while you still have uh, your food that your system is more familiar with, uh, start blending in uh, some snacks of some of the smaller items uh, that you found find that you believe to be safe in the wild, and don't wait till you've exhausted your initial food supply. And that's really a good tip. Uh, you know, if you do, let's say you have mountain house food with you, or you you have trail food, trail mixes with you, or whatever, and you see, well, let's say you're stranded on the far side of a flooded river and it appears you're going to be there for several weeks for whatever reason, then there you want to gradually go from your prepared foods you brought with you to edible wild plants and, as I said before earlier, the the proteins. It may be insects. It may be fish you catch. It may be bird eggs you find. But your your body's got to adjust to this, and if you can do it with – with the food you brought with you and gradually get into these edible wild food sources, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Now, that is a great great piece of information in itself. What about meat? Uh, you know, you've, you've mentioned a lot of the wild edible plants and how they can be very challenging to learn and identify and find out of season and know when they're edible and prepare, etc. What about meat sources? You mentioned that in passing at the beginning. Are those more... Uh, reliable as far as being themselves edible and, and acceptable to our system? Well, they're... That's a good question. They they are often, especially, again, if somebody is trained, you know, it's to me it's a whole lot easier sometimes to snare a rabbit than it is to try to find enough or, or an equal amount of edible wild plants, especially in the wintertime. So, um, yeah, I, I, I always try in the classes that I teach, let's start start with insects, fish, reptiles, animals, birds, bird eggs, things of that type, and get, get that kind of down, and then go to the edible wild plants. You know, if, you, if you've got a rabbit that you've dispatched, it's pretty easy, even for a person that's never done much of this, to know you got to extract the legs, the skin, the head, and the intestines and all. But the rest of it is edible. All you got to do is figure out some way to kind of get that thing cooked. And if you can build a fire, you probably can get it cooked. So that's that's pretty easy. It's, uh, it's easy to identify all these things. Almost all of the fish we know are edible. Um, birds, about all the birds are edible. Bird eggs are edible. Uh, 
not all insects are edible, but the vast majority of them are. Most reptiles are edible, even the ones that um, are venomous. You can, all you got to do is extract a part of them where the venom lies, and you, you the rest of it you can eat. I've eaten cotton mouths and rattlesnakes many, many times and uh, with no ill effects at all. But it, it requires, for long-term survival, it requires a knowledge of both because you may be in an area where finding a rabbit just may be seem like the last thing you're ever going to do, but there may be cattails there or vice versa. So the person that's, let's say, prepping for a serious long-term survival situation they would do well to learn all of this and one of the things i think we ought to discuss just a little bit is what the air force calls their edibility test or edibility rules and that is if you're kind of a novice at edible wild plants how can you ease into it and not get yourself in trouble and it's really in it's about five steps to it, and I'll try to make this brief as I can, but it, it is important, and it's been proven many times that this works. The first thing you want to do, and let's say you find what you think, but you're not sure, are some a wild rose hips. It looks like rose hips. You think it's rose hips, but you're not sure. Just take one of those and take a small mouthful, and you chew it. You wait about five minutes for any effects, such as burning, stinging, numbing, or any effects of that type. If all goes well after about five minutes, swallow what you've been chewing on. Okay, so that I was, that's what I was going to ask you is, <laughs> you didn't say swallow, so I'm just checking. No, 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 you don't swallow at that point. You just you keep... make sure that you don't get this burning, stinging, and numbing sensation before you start swallowing. And you got to give it, it takes about five minutes because... An awful lot of these plants you do not want to ingest. The burning, the sting, and the numbing will occur almost immediately. But after about five minutes, then go ahead and chew the rose hip up good and swallow it and give it about eight hours. Just go to sleep on it. If there's no diarrhea, cramps, pains, numbing, vomiting, any of those kind of things the next morning, then you want to take a couple more of these what you think are rose hips and uh, ingest those and then wait another eight hours. And if if you've gone through two eight-hour periods with this plant and you have no ill effects at all, your digestive system seems to handle it all right, then you've probably got a, a plant that is safe to eat. That's that's the fourth step is to, uh, after this two eight-hour periods, then you got to plant safe to eat. And then the fifth part of this Air Force rules are never eat mushrooms or fungi of any kind. There are, as everybody knows and loves them in restaurants and at home, there are some great mushrooms out there. But there are so few that in the wild that really are edible, and it's so difficult to identify those. The best thing to do is leave those alone, unless you're a mushroom expert. And then... If that's the case, then go for it. <laughs> so your first step threw me off because I had heard a much more uh, cautious approach, and I don't know if it's if it's one you've heard before. Is the first step of just rubbing the plant on the outside of your uh, skin, like even the outer skin of your cheek or your yeah. arm, and see if you get a reaction, and then see that yeah, kind of thing. That, that that's 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 wise because let's say you get into some stinging nettle. Yeah. And you certainly don't want to put that in your mouth. So, um, or let's say, oh, it's hard to believe somebody might do this, but let's say you get into prickly pear, which is an edible plant, but without taking those little hair-like spines off of it by burning them or scraping them with a knife or something, you stick those in your mouth, you'll spend the next four or five days just trying to get spines out of your tongue. So, uh, yeah, what what you're saying, it really is... The Air Force didn't put that into their rules, but that would be a good first rule. And uh, any corresponding rules, uh, would anything be different for wild meats if you're able to capture a frog or a toad or a bird or a fish or something? Is there some that you just best stay away from? Well, there... and, and, and again, we're speaking North America, but 
the toads, the warts we see, or what we call warts on toads, those can be toxic pain. You want to, if you got a toad, you certainly want to skin him. Uh, but vast majority of the animals. The only other thing I can think of real quick is the liver of a polar bear. Uh, you don't want to eat that. It's so, it's so unbelievably high in vitamins, and it can throw you into shock real quick. But uh, with and like I said, with venomous snakes, you always want to get the head away so that somehow or another you don't come in contact, step on the head or something like that. And first thing, you know, you've, uh, you've got rattlesnake venom in you, you didn't mean to have. But in snakes, reptiles, fish, insects, birds and all that sort of thing, once you get them skinned, once you get the intestines out of them, you're in pretty good shape. You can't go too wrong there it, it may be too he may have trouble cooking it and he, in a lot of these cases you could eat it raw if you had to and many people have survived doing that is there any practice uh, that's that's easy for people who are coming out of an urban or suburban environment who barely get out into the woods to co- try to do is there any sort of safe way to get your dip your toe in the water on a weekend and try doing some of this stuff in a small scale without without it uh, being too disruptive to your system in my opinion, this is my opinion, a person who really doesn't, doesn't spend a lot, of, a lot of time in the back country or in, outdoors, really, rather than take a book or print off a whole lot of stuff they find on the Internet about edible wild plants and then go to a state park and start grazing around, I think that's very foolish. I think if they're that serious about it, then... They should get with the local university, or it's not hard to find an awful lot of courses are offered in edible wild plants, and get a, a genuine course where somebody is out there with you and can walk you through all this. That's a whole lot better than going out there and making a major mistake, and then suddenly you've got, you've got yourself and maybe other people you've carried out there with you to do this little experiment and you've got some deathly ill people. That uh, that has happened so many times. And I know of some people one time, not not too long ago, that thought they they knew absolutely nothing about wild nuts to speak of, other than what they'd seen in a grocery store. They thought they'd found a, a lot of chestnuts, and they ate buckeyes. And almost every one of them passed away. They had to fight for their lives. So that can happen very easy by just going out and trying just to stick your toe in the water a little bit. Any other uh, general guidelines or tips for those who are interested in increasing their chances of uh, surviving uh, out in the wild from uh, other tips that come to your mind from your years of experience of finding uh, wild edibles? Uh, The biggest thing is just get, and that's what I try to emphasize most when I'm involved in these kind of discussions is, Get the training you need. This this is no place to mess up. It, it is so easy to get yourself in a life-threatening situation that, and there's so many courses available that really are good that rather than take any chances, just be serious about it. And, yeah, it's fine to, to buy the books, and there are lots of them on edible wild plants and study those, but get someone who is an ex- truly an expert and go out with them and get them to teach you how to find these different edible wild plants and then go the next step, prepare them, and actually eat them. And a lot of these can be with a little ripe preparation. They can be pretty good to eat. They're not going to be like what we're accustomed to by any means. Chances are real good you may not have any kind of salt or anything with you. So they're going to be kind of flat tasting. Some of them are kind of bitter. But... They will keep you going. If you know the right ones and how to prepare them and you're in a location where they can be found, then you can you can go a long time. The, North, uh, the Native Americans did it for centuries, so we can do it for a year or two we had to. Remind us again where you think people can find the most likely uh, skilled trainers in their location. The probably the best source is in whatever state you you live in. The land grant college in that state has courses, or at least knows people who really are experts and can uh, hook you up with those people. 
And that would be, that's what I recommend to everybody. The land-grant colleges, these are usually your, your agricultural colleges in every state. Someone there is teaching courses like this, and it's not hard to find them. And usually they're little or no expense at all. And a, a weekend course can move you light years ahead in, in beginning to get into edible wild plants. Well, Jay Wayne Fears, you are a lifelong experienced outdoorsman and survivor. We just uh, thank you always for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. And we'd like to have you back again to talk with us about more of your uh, survival tips about uh, cr- creating shelter. And uh, thank you once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Always my pleasure.